Welcome, this is Street Fires, and we now listen to your welcome. Thank you, Denise. I think we have started um, on a good note with that prayer from Principal Parks. Good afternoon, everyone. Special mention of our presenters this afternoon, Ms. Justin Collins and, and Mr. Omar Bell. We thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the JCE campus's data protection webinar. And we are really pleased that you could join us today to participate in the discussion on this very important area of governance and risk management, which has gained the global attention and action. In an area where data is key to most businesses and is shared so freely and even pirated at times, we believe that it is important that every organization and country be mindful of the consequences of data and how it impacts us. In an electronic and digital age, regulations of data is even more critical in order to ensure good order. The consideration of data protection, therefore, must be at the front and center of all organizations, whether it be not-for-profit or for-profit, listed or unlisted. Actually, I, I just want to quickly share with you that recently we were completing at the JSE Group a global assessment document, and it was replete with questions about how we protected data, questions surrounding data or data officers, responsible officers, just to name a few. So I'm really pleased to see that finally, Jamaica has now passed in June the Data Protection Act 2020, which seeks to safeguard the privacy of personal information of Jamaicans, and that this has had the consensus of both the House and the Senate and of, on both sides of the divide. It is most important that as practitioners and stewards of companies that we immerse ourselves in understanding about the act within this transitional period before the legislation comes into effect. So that at the point when it does come into effect, we will have cleared many hurdles and be in full compliance. For this webinar, we have ensured that we have a capable subject matter experts who are very equipped to uncover the subject matter from framework to technology. We know that you are bombarded with a lot of webinars and a lot of Zooms and all those activities on the computer throughout your busy day. So we are most grateful, we are thankful that you have found it necessary to come to this particular and very important webinar. I wish to welcome you all to the session today because I believe that your, it will be worth, well worth your time, attendance, and participation. And I underscore the word participation. Please stay tuned and enjoy the time with the JCE campus. And in closing, what I want to remind you of is the fact that we have put, we were the first really um, to put out um, information and um, sessions on data protection. Um, and we are saying that we are fully equipped with a program which will cover over a period how you go and navigate through this process. We want to welcome you to this session and we also want to welcome you to participate in any appropriate sessions that we may have following this one. I invite you to relax, to enjoy the sessions, to ask questions and be informed and continue to make the JSC and the JSEE campus your campus of choice. Thank you and again, welcome. Okay. Thank you very much, Mrs. Street Forest. And now we're going to have an introduction and, and expose you to our first very learned speaker. 
Miss Justine A. Collins, attorney at law at Hart Muirhead at Fata. Now, Miss Collins was called to the bar in 2016, but she hasn't stopped there. She has an avid interest in technology law with a research focus on blockchain applications, computer law, financial technology, which is fintech, and e-commerce law. Now, Miss Collins also has a certificate in fintech law and policy from Duke University and a certificate in fintech from the Said Business School at the University of Oxford. Justine, as she likes to be called, is presently co-chair of the Publications Committee and a member of two subcommittees of the Jamaican Bar Association. So you are in excellent hands for this protection, data protection presentation. Welcome, Ms. Collins. Thank you so much, Denise, for that introduction. And thank you so much, Mrs. Street Forest, Principal Parks, everybody on. I see we have 144 participants. Um, I hope everybody's hearing me well. If not, just let me know and I'll adjust. But thank you so much for having me here. I'm just going to, if you give me a minute or so, let me just share my screen so that we can have something to look at while I present. Once again, thank you so much for having me. Um, I will be looking. So um, my colleague Omar Bell from TTEC will be looking at some of the technical sides of things, but I wanted to give sort of a broad overview of the bill as it is right now. It's been passed by the House of Representatives. It's been passed by the Senate, but it hasn't been signed as yet by the Governor General and enacted into law. So it's still technically a bill. So we're going to be looking at the Data Protection Bill 2020 and just some of the um, major provisions that we should be aware of. Just a little taster of the fantastic certificate program that the JSE eCampus has. So to give you a broad overview of what we'll be looking at today, we're going to be looking at what are some of the policy objectives underlying the bill, key definitions, data protection standards. Some of these rights of the data subjects, regulatory oversight, penalties, and just some business strategies that Denise and I are gonna look at. Okay, policy objectives. Uh, just to remind us, <clears throat> now CARI Forum, which is a forum of um, many CARICOM states, they entered into an Economic Partnership Agreement, or EPA, with the European Union in 2008. One, some of the provisions of that EPA provide that these states must provide an appropriate legal and regulatory regime for data protection. So these high international standards need to be provided in our local legislation. We had certain time periods within which to implement these and some, per, some countries were able to do it. We are kind of Jagged, like lagging behind a bit, but we are now finally able to comply with that EPA. And this is the data protection bill as it is right now. It's updated. We used to have a 2017 version, which myself and my colleague Andre Shekelford, who's at Partner Head Vata as well with me, we were able to do submissions on some of the provisions of the bill. And I put my disclaimer as, again, this is the bill as it is right now. And once it's passed, once it's signed by the Governor General and gazetted, it will be enacted as law. So just some key definitions to just to get the ball going. What is personal data? We hear a lot about personal data, especially when it comes to um, the European Union, we hear about the Googles, we hear about the Facebooks, we hear about the Apples, and we hear about personal data being misused, Cambridge Analytica, all of these things. But what really is personal data? What, what does that mean? Now, uh, within the Act or the Bill, personal data means information, however stored. Now, that however, however stored is very important because it may just be a tablet, it may be a computer, it may be a phone, it may be a file relating to a living individual 
or an individual who has been deceased for less than 30 years. And that's one of the changes we're seeing from the 2017 version from to this one. It used to just be a living individual and now it seems as if their estate can also be able to um, rely on some of the rights under the bill. So personal data is personal. It kind of implies what it means. It relates to that individual who can be identified from that information. So for example, we have, if you have <clears throat> an ID card and it says Justine Collins and it has my TRN and it has all of this information about me, you can identify that that is Justine Collins. But there's also other ways in which things can be identifiable. If it is that the data controller, and we're gonna go to that definition in a bit, can identify from that data, if they have information about that person and from that information they can identify you, that's also personal data. For example, if you had a document that only had your NIS number, but some the data controller had, for example, Justine Collins NIS number this, and they can identify me from that NIS number. The NIS number alone would be personal data for that purpose. A data subject. Data subject is the person who is the subject of that personal data. So I, in that same example with my driver's license, Justine Collins is the data subject. So I am the person, I am the one that has the rights under this Data Protection Act. And so in determining whether an individual is identifiable, and we talked about what makes a person identifiable, you look at all means used or reasonably used, likely to be used by the data controller or any other person to identify that individual, such as reference to an identification number or other identifying characteristics, whether physical, social, or otherwise, which are like reasonably likely to lead to the identification of that individual. So let's take back that, let's take an example like, for example, a photograph. Um, if we, you have this photograph of me floating all over with the posters, without my name, it wouldn't necessarily be identifiable to you, but if it is that we know that we have other images in our data bank and we say, okay, this is Justine Collins, she has black hair, she has brown skin, she has all of these things, so we're able to identify her from all of that data. So those are other factors that could be reasonably used to identify a data subject. A processing is very interesting as well. Processing can be a wide range of activities. So it could be as simple as you um, organizing data, putting it together, filing it, recording it. Um, nowadays, what I see, I've been seeing, is that we've been collecting a lot of what? Temperature, health data. And I've seen some security guards as well writing down the temperatures of those persons and writing it down and saying XYZ has a temperature of that. That is processing for the purposes of the data protection. So as to whether or not there's some liability incurring, we'll see. And um, it's clear that that could still be processing. And there are cases like the Google Spain case where even the indexing and what Google does to list all that information on one page, that is deemed to be processing as well. So it can be organizing, it can be recording, it can be retrieving, it can be disclosing data. Data controller. So we talked about the Googles, the, the Facebooks, the Apples, the Jamaica National Bank, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, all of those persons who are entities that are processing personal data, those are called data controllers. So data controllers are the ones that determine the manner and purposes for which data is processed. So once you are in a position where even if you're not processing it yourself, even if you're outsourcing, even if you get somebody else to do the processing for you, that doesn't mean once you are the one that determines, okay, please process this for me, I need it for X, 
you are the data controller. So it tends to be uh, a company, but it can even be a natural person like me or you. Oh, one last thing, sorry, I forgot to mention. So there's a data processor as well, which would contemplate, for example, you outsourcing IT functions to another entity. Data processor doesn't mean necessarily an employee of the data controller. So if you have an IT company that does all of your processing and you have your servers there, um, they would be data processors, but their processing is on behalf of the data controller. So that, that still means that the obligations lie with the data controller. And throughout the legislation, what we're going to see is the interfacing between the data subject, like me, the data controller, which is the one that processes the data, and the, to a lesser extent, the data processor, because sometimes there may not be a data processor, sometimes there will be. But most of the rights and the obligations accrue to the data subject, and there are quite a bit of registration and compliance um, issues when it comes to the data controller. Now the application of the act. Now I thought this was very, very interesting. We've moved from the 2017 bill where it only applied to companies established in Jamaica or which had servers in Jamaica or equipment in Jamaica. But we've seen an expansion of that in the 2020 bill where we're also seeing processing of per personal data of a data subject who is in Jamaica. So if you have for example, a Facebook or an Amazon offering goods or services to data subjects in Jamaica, they could also fall within the ambits of this act. Um, so it's a little ambitious. We're seeing a stretching, similar to the type of stretching that the GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation does. Not sure if you're familiar with that, but the General Data Protection Regulation is the European Union's regulation for data protection and it has certain extraterritorial considerations so it tries to stretch outside of the eu um, so we're seeing as well where the act applies to people who are offering goods or services to data subjects in jamaica monitoring their behavior so tracking cookies that type of thing that could also fall within the act even if you're not a company established in Jamaica. So as to whether or not it's the information commissioner is sufficiently empowered to exercise these powers is a separate discussion, but it seems to try and give the data subject a relatively strong assurance of their rights. So just going very, very quickly through, we have eight data protection standards to go through. And um, in our classes, uh, Mrs. Street Forest like, spoke about the fact that we were one of the pioneers in terms of the data protection course. We have to know all the eight standards by heart. And it's, it's very exciting to see everybody saying, oh yes, that's the fourth standard, oh, that's the fifth standard. So it's um, engaging. So the data protection standards, section 21 of the act, requires that data controllers comply with all the data protection standards. And if there's a breach of those standards, they, they must notify the information commissioner. And we will talk a little bit about that agency a little later. And just to give you an idea, data controllers who possess data in contravention of any of the standards may face a fine of $2 million or imprisonment up to seven years. Now, the first data protection standard is fair and lawful processing. Now, it says that personal data should not be processed unless consent is obtained from that data subject. Now, this concept of fair and lawful processing is really twofold. There's lawful processing and there's fair processing. A lawful processing is whether or not you, as it says, lawfully or legally process the data. So these really um, detail the ways or the mechanisms in which you can lawfully process.
process personal data. Consent being a very big one, and we'll go into what consent means and um, what that encompasses. If the processing is necessary for the contract with a data subject. So if you have a situation where you're transacting with a party, if you're transacting, um, let's say you are buying a piece of land, and in you buying a piece of land, you need to give the other person your TRN because you need to pay certain taxes on the purchase of that land. That is processing that's necessary for the contract with the data subject. If the processing is necessary for compliance with a legal obligation to which the data controller is subject, we're gonna talk about the banks and how they have certain anti-money laundering regulations, certain KYC protocols, those are laws that the financial institutions have to comply with and so that processing is necessary. So that is how processing could be lawful. If it's necessary for the administration of justice, if you need to supply it in connection with court proceedings, et cetera, that might be a lawful way. If processing is necessary for the vital interest of our data subjects, so we're talking about life and death situations, doctors trying to decide certain things, that is lawfully processing. Necessary for the functions of government, similar, you may need to get certain information, PRN, in order to transact with the government. Or if it is that the data subject has published it on Instagram or somewhere, then it would be a lawful, the data controller can lawfully process the data. Oh. I wanted to take a specific look at consent. And consent is something that we have spoken about at length. Consent <clears throat> right here means any informed, specific, unequivocal, freely given expression of the wishes, uh, will, sorry, by which the data subject agrees to the processing of that data subject's personal data. Now we're seeing where we've taken the definition of consent straight from the GDPR, which is a very expansive definition. Um, this was something that we had recommended because it was the consent that they had before was very just any freely given consent. But this one now links it back to purposes and it requires that the, da the data controller collect your data and tell you why they're collecting their data, your data. So that's where the informed comes in. Freely given as well is that you're not doing it under duress, you're not doing it under because you have to or because they won't give you a, a service without giving your consent. So that measure of consent I think is very, very good in terms of complying with high international standards. So this, the consent is one of the ways in which you can lawfully process data once again. And as we said before, the other limb of the test is fairness. So has this data been collected fairly? How did they get the data? Was the person misled when they were, when the data co controller was collecting the data? Did they tell them, oh yes, we're using it for this, but we're really using it for that? Well, the second standard, we just want to recap. We went through. The first one is, Denise, if you could help me here. The first standard is fair and lawful. Data collection. Fair and lawful processing. Processing. <laughs> and the second standard is purpose limitation. Right. So, let, let me jump in here. Justine, let me tell you. This is very serious information. I think... Whereas we're doing some repeating, so persons who are coming in, because we have, what, 196 participants? Wow. 197, that they're following along. For me, as a layperson, what jumps out is up to seven years imprisonment and up to $2 million in well. fines. And so data protection, making sure that it's purpose-driven, making sure that you follow the compliance regulations and these that eight areas that you say that people have to know off the top of their head 
it's a serious. Oh my goodness, the people are just flying into this. Well, that's great to hear, Denise. Um, definitely. So that was just in relation to the data protection standards, but I'm going to have a section where we talk about the penalties because I know that that's huge. every time we talk about laws, they're, they're like, all right, skip over all, all this stuff. Let's just get to where I, the bad part. What, what's the bad part? <laughs> but I want to say thank you to the Stock Exchange for hosting this webinar and for them to really be on the forefront because, Justine, this is a brand new career path. But Jamaica, this <laughs> well, is definitely. a creation and it's, it's an opportunity for persons to pay attention to take on the certification that the Jamaica Stock Exchange offers because right now it's a six month investment in the certificate course. And within six months, you are going to be up to date into brand new legislation, a brand new career. So that is true value for money. Oh, well, for sure. Hand it back over to you. Thank you. Um, definitely, I agree with you, Denise. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a, a career path, and it would be very, very good if people could think about doing the certification. Exactly. Even for laymen, I think that it's great for you to be aware of your rights. So much times in Jamaica, we're not aware of our rights. And even if you come away from this presentation so saying there are eight data protection standards that I must be aware of and these are my rights. And I know that when you know a large organization tries to directly market certain things and send text messages, I know that I have these rights. So That's let's fair. jump back in. Yes. Um, yes. So when data controllers are obtaining personal data, they need to obtain it for one or more specified and lawful purposes. So they can't necessarily say, okay, we're going to take this data and we're going to collect it. We're going to use it in order to process your land sale, but then you see them using it for other purposes or they're taking it for one thing and then, you know, like a large telecommunications provider and you're now seeing text messages coming from all of these other organizations that you didn't give your data to and you didn't give your consent to. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Um, data minimization. So data, personal data which is collected shall be adequate, relevant, and not excessive in relation to the purpose for which it is obtained. So if you went to a store and you wanted to buy some candy or something like that, um, and then the cashier said to you, I need your TRN and you're like, why do you need my TRN? I'm just buying, <laughs> I'm just buying a sweetie. What is that really proportionate with the purpose? So it needs to be adequate and relevant. Um, I may I jump in one more because I said the persons are, we're at 200 now. So, you know, congratulations to the persons who are coming in. Thanks, to, thanks guys for joining. Yes. Um, you know, culturally though, we are resistant as much as we need data protection we are culturally not willing to give a lot of data so there is that balance and so when we get the data maybe we don't even ask what where is it being stored what's being done with it is it being sold I, it's just a, you know this so data protection we haven't even touched on identity theft there's just so much in you know, this area that allows your mind to just expand. And, and what we're touching on here in this webinar, the six months certificate program will just, you know, expand and expand and you'll come out of it so empowered. Oh, definitely. And I think that um, people aren't aware of how they miss, how their data is being um, intercepted. I, one of the things that we talked about in some of our classes was Facebook login, which mm. is you have like Facebook login for different sites and then Facebook allows, like it's, it's really easy. You don't want to go and you want to put in your email address and your password again and you're just like, all right, yeah, Facebook login, cool. And do you know how much information you give up just by that? So, and they use it to track you and they use it to market stuff like you. And that's why people are like, oh, you know, I think Google is listening to me because 
you be talking about something and automatically you see these that has happened. Up on your screen and you're just like you see the ads come <laughs> <out> around me <laughs> yes, indeed indeed no the data protection it's unreal you know it's so <laughs> it's so unreal and then you know i think the closest the average person may have come to this data thing is where maybe you know there was a time when persons were getting emails to say oh remember me i'm your dear friend i'm stuck in oh, yes send a thousand us to rescue me you know so that kind of phishing and scamming is something we know but we don't know the the depth of which you know the the dark web is is active in data protection and an education on data protection is is such a such a thing i mean kudos to you in 2016 for seeing this trend and specializing in it in terms of law and coming home to Jamaica to, to share that knowledge. Well, I'm just grateful for the opportunities and, you know, the stock exchange doing such great work as well. Yes. Um, and um, yes, so let's just dr dive back in so that we're not, because right. it's quite a and everybody's having quite a feast. Yes. Um, so personal data shall be kept accurate and up to date. So that's your fourth standard. Okay. Fifth standard is personal data shall not be kept for longer than is necessary for the purpose of processing. And this is something that may just be defined um, in terms of timelines, maybe sector specific, because banks may have different timelines and from law firms and attorneys, there may be like sort of sectors coming together and saying, all right, seven years for this and five years for that and 10 years for this, depending on what their I do sure duties are. Um, sixth one is kind of like a catch-all one. It says that your personal data shall be processed in accordance with the rights of the data professional, the data subject under the DPA. So it sort of encapsulates all of the different rights that you have in, in the bill. And the seventh one is security. So this is where I'm hoping that Omar will sort of fill the gap but it requires that the data controller shall have appropriate um, technical and organizational measures to process personal data. So it's not only having your antivirus and whatever um, actual technical measures that you have in place, but also your people. So this is why seminars like these are important. Your people, you need to train people as to how to collect data. How do you process it? How do we use it? How do we misuse it? And a lot of that will depend on, in terms of standards, will depend on the nature of the data that's processed and the harm that's likely to be to result. And I see as well where this may be, I think there are certain ISO standards which have been um, adopted by the Bureau of Standards that you can get as well. Um, and of course, the information commissioner must be notified um, of any breaches of security measures, and there's extensive provisions in the bill about that. That's very extensive. Yeah. And our eighth and final one is data transfer. So personal data should not be trans of Jamaica Jamaican data subjects should not be transferred outside of Jamaica unless that territory ensures an adequate level of protection for rights and freedoms. So the minister in, with responsibility for this portfolio, which should probably be MSET, will be prescribing those territories. In the EU, for example, they have a list of territories that have um, appropriate safeguards. We are not one, but it's a very small list. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully with all of these legislative changes, we can um, probably try and become one. All right. so. Very quickly, once again, the yeah, rights yeah. of the data subject. So you have a right of access to your personal data, which means that you have a right to ask the data controller, look, what are you processing about me? What do you have in your possession? And they also have a right to, um, for a charge, ask for copies of that data. So you can actually go to these data controllers who are registered and ask, hey, I'm Justine Collins, I know you have information about me. But of course, there are certain exemptions, like, for example, tax authorities, um, the police, 
I don't think it's reasonable for you to be like, hey, Jamaica Constabulary Force, what do you really have about me? I'd like to know <laughs> for my own purposes. Yeah. Um, yeah. The second oh, one is oh, oh, sorry. Right. And access the the information they do have on you. So you can get a police report, you can oh, yes. get a credit report. You know, you you do have the right to the information. Right, but there are certain exemptions as well. Okay. So the consent required for direct marketing, you are required to, you are, you are, you are allowed to get, well, the data controller needs to get consent for direct marketing. So if it is that, as we talked about, um, there are certain text messages, there are certain, um, um, promos, bonuses, all those kinds of things, they need to get your consent before they start to market these things to you. Um, the right to prevent processing of personal data. Uh, this is another expansion compared to the bill that we had before, where we essentially, there's a very expansive right now, it, it was just limited to distress processing causing distress or damage but right. now it is the right to prevent processing within prescribed circumstances in the act you can actually prevent them from processing certain personal data okay right. uh in relation to automated decision making i think you had a question about this denise for example if there's automated decision making in relation to your viability for a job in relation okay. to your credit worthiness, yeah, if there yeah. is some sort of automation in that yeah. decision making, you have a right to be informed of the logic involved in that decision making. Yes, yes. Um, that is, is something that I think um, as we move towards automated, like bots, as they call them, that looks at resumes and, and even exam papers, um, the human interaction is, is less and the reliance on the technology is more, but then that is exposing persons. So I'm glad you brought that up. Well, definitely. And, and I think there was a, there was a case a couple of years ago um, with Amazon where they realized that they had um, implemented some automation in terms of their job select, selection. And they realized a couple of years later because of the AIs that they were using that they had just male white college dropouts constantly being hired. And then the female PhD graduates would not be hired because the way that the, the way that the AI had worked was that it was, there was a bias in the system towards these people who are sort of, um, you know, the persons who classic, who are categorized as those successful sort of tech persons. Um, and and it, it unfairly biased against the persons that they would have wanted to hire and then led to diversity and inclusivity problems. So it's important even from just feelings, just in terms of equalizing and normalizing the playing field in terms of automation, there, there are flaws. So um, the right to request rectification of inaccuracies. So if there's anything on incorrect about you, you have a right to um, rectify it. Yeah. Regulatory oversight. All right, so the act establishes the Office of the Information Commissioner who monitors compliance under the act, also maintains a register of the data controllers, and he just, well, he or she, it's very inclusive, disseminates information about good practices um, there's also a power to issue assessment notices, enforcement notices um, to determine compliance. And data controllers, most data controllers subject to the provisions in the Act are required to be, are required to be registered as data controller. There's um, an annual fee and if you do not register as a data controller, this constitutes an offense and a $1 million fine. Data protection officers. Data controllers are required to appoint data protection officers if it is that you are a 
public authority, if you process sensitive personal data, or you process personal data on a large scale. So there are certain qualifications. And this, this officer ensures that the data controller processes personal data in compliance with the, the act as well as the standards. Uh, this office is very important because um, ultimately there are certain obligations on the officer because they can even go to the information commissioner and say, look, I told the data controller that there was this breach, nothing was done, and the information, information commissioner can come in and say, look, what's going on? Uh, the data protection officer has told me that there is this breach and nothing has really happened. There's also a requirement for data protection impact assessment reports to be submitted annually. And I presume that the data protection officer would be um, required or who would be the one who would be assisting in that report. So data controllers need to also, that's another reason why this program is just really great in terms of training data protection officers as well as assisting in terms of the data protection impact assessment report. Um, yeah, we take yeah. some time and we look at what those integral components are and what we can expect to see in terms of people bringing back that knowledge and going to their organizations and saying, okay, this is how we're going to do the report. Okay. That is awesome. Penalties. Oh. Yes, this is <laughs> Which is, I guess, the juicy part. <laughs> um, liability and penalties. And we've had a change from the 2017 bill. The present change is that if you are found to be in contravention of the act, you may be liable as a company to a fine not exceeding 4% of your annual gross worldwide turnover. So that's a pretty heavy fine right there. 4% of your annual gross worldwide turnover. <laughs> that is, wow. Right, we are moving from 10% of annual gross income, but I think that this is now worldwide turnover. So it's a bit more expansive. Wow. Um, there's also the possibility of personal liability so if it is found that the offense was committed with the connivance of or neglect of a director, manager, or secretary of that company, that person may be liable as well and punished. Yeah, so yeah. if you as a director of a company, then realize that you, you've neglected in terms of the duties of the data controller in terms of compliance, mm. or you have, <laughs> you have willfully tried to, you know, contravene the act, then it is that not only the company could be liable, you as well personally. Wow. Yes. This, this act has teeth. Unfortunately, yes. Um, civil liability. So there's also the possibility of um, somebody or your data subject suing the data controller. So they may be entitled to compensation depending on how the court determines it. Of course, all of this is determined by the court. Yeah. Um, yeah. So business strategies. So this is where we get into some of the tips and um, feedback that we can give to companies. Now, how can you prepare yourself for the data protection? One of, some of the things you can do is you can assess your organization and identify ways in which you collect personal data right now. Look at what you're doing. What, where's, where are you collecting most of the personal data? Where are the flows of information? Look at the security measures centered around your restriction of access. Do you have any protocols in place? Quite a bit of places have cybersecurity policies, but mm. how, how are we actually implementing it? Do you have monitoring and reporting requirements for your employees? Do you have offsite backup? All of this, I think, in terms of the technical part will be explored more fully with Omar. Yeah. Um, integrating antivirus and security systems in your online database. In terms of 
Compliance. Which department or officer would be best to address regulatory compliance? What do you think, Denise? Is this something that HR should do, or do you think that it's something that legal should do? I think, honestly, listening to you, I think that the person with a certification through the Jamaica Stock Exchange will be so integral in management decision because I think persons don't have a clue. Because whose lap does this drop in? As you said, HR, do they hire an attorney? Well, they probably have to. But the person with the certification for the stock exchange will be first out the gate in helping craft the policies in you know, the assessment. Just, just imagine a project that a company has to take on like this and, and they have no clue, not even of the vocabulary, the basic data compliance vocabulary. And you with certification, you come in. I mean, your role in the company will be a very, 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 you know, 21st century role. I, you know, I don't know how else to say it. That is true. So you'd also need to look at just some of the compliance costs as well. The appointment of the data protection officer, rectification requests, your data protection, your data impact assessment report. Somebody needs to prepare these. Somebody needs to be able to handle all of these, depending on how much processing you envision your organization to have. Yeah. Develop a privacy policy and in-house procedures and ensure you also need to think about are you processing EU data subjects data because the GDPR may also be applicable to you and that's an entirely different regime. Um, creation of an official standards for employees. Training, are we training our employees on how to safely collect data, how to use it, store it, alter it and remove it? And let's look at our consent mechanisms. Do we have consent mechanisms? Consent is the most widely used basis for lawfully processing data. That's part of the first standard. Um, avoid browse wrap, mandatory consent, and pre-checked boxes. Now, the, the problem with pre-checked boxes and browse wrap and mandatory consent is that that goes against the freely given nature of consent. If you recall, when we look back at the definition of consent, that's yeah. why the definitions are very important in terms of then bring it to bringing it to implementation. Pre-check boxes um, do not allow you to freely give your consent. That's right. Keep users informed by directing them to your privacy policy. And also keep telling them about the purpose for which it will be collected, used, or disposed, and obtain their consent in writing. I jumped forward to Denise's little exercise that is coming up. Um, consent requests must be set separate from other terms and conditions. And you need to ensure you give each option for each consent. So if you're gonna, you're gonna collect data using text, you're gonna collect data using email, you're gonna collect data using um, any other medium, you need post or mail, you need to collect, get your consent for each one. So once again, we make it practical. So yeah. we're gonna look at this. This is a consent mechanism from Sainsbury's, which is a supermarket chain in the UK. Now, it says it's really great, you know, terms and conditions. We want you to know exactly how our service works and why we need your registration details. You state that you've read and agreed to these terms, that's fine. Now, contact permission is where we are really concerned with today. We'd love to send you money off coupons, exclusive offers, and the latest info from Sainsbury's by email, post, SMS, phone, and other electronic means. We'll always treat your personal details with the utmost care and we'll never sell them to other marketing companies. Now it says yes please or no thanks. Denise, what do you think about this consent mechanism? Is it adequate? I, I like it because 
I see this, this, this exclamation point and it draws my attention to it, you know, um, and uh, it gives me options. I think especially with contact formation, it gives me op options, but let me know. Okay, great. Let's keep you blurring. <laughs> yeah, I haven't taken the course, which I, I think I need to after listening to this webinar because let me say, I mean, I, I wanted to ask as well, you know, this is a website. So it's kind of easy for, you know, someone like a T-Tech to set this up for a company. But a lot of people in terms of like, you're looking somewhere to rent, you have to give your, you know, your driver's license or your TRA, you know, you're looking for a job and you give personal data, your, your, your school certification and such. And, and that may or may not go in the garbage if you're not a successful job candidate or if you don't get the house to rent. How does the data protection act um, answer that kind of on the ground day-to-day -day question? The, que the query of whether or not what happens to data after it's not needed? Right, so if the HR department just throws it out or the, the, the person selling the house or renting the house is going to garbage, I mean, you know, who cares? But clearly the Data Protection Act says you need to care and there needs to be a system in place. Well, there are, dis there are destruction requirements under one of the standards um, in terms of destroying data once it's not needed. So that would be in, con in contemplation of that. Okay. Um, so it shouldn't be a problem. The problem is when you misuse it or you sell it to other persons or you're using it for more than one purpose or there's a security breach. If you yeah. destroy yeah. it, shred it or whatever after it's needed, that, that is exactly what the Data Protection Act sort of contemplates you doing. Okay. But just bring it back to here, Denise. Do you see anything yeah. that, that is probably lacking in this? Or this is great. You'd use this consent mechanism for scenes, for <laughs> You could be on the spot. You know, the only thing that bothers me is that the I agree to the terms and conditions is my only choice at the top. You know, because it doesn't say I don't agree. Because if it if it gives me I'm listening to you, I think now I need to have a I agree or I don't agree button. You could. But then that's not really about the personal data. So what we're really looking at is a contact permission. Uh, and the problem with this is that they lump all of the media together. So they have email, uh, post, SMS, phone, and electronic means. You may want, you may be a text person and you may say, yeah, I'd like to get information by text. I consent to that and I consent to giving you my data for that. Right. But I'm not really into emails and I don't check my post office. I don't have a post office box. Or you may be a little older and you don't know why I did this. I sent you bills by text message, which happened to my aunt the other day. And she's like, I need an email. I don't, I don't understand this. So it may giving them the option that that's in line with the consent that's required under the act. Yeah. So there's some of the things that we look at in the seminar in the, um, the course. And so you see this one now, <clears throat> it separates all of them. Yes, please, I would like to um, receive communications by email, communications by telephone, so it separates them and you can tick the ones that you want. Or you can say, no, I don't want anything. Right. So uh, this is a consent mechanism. Well, this is a good, a, a, a good explanation by ITV, another UK company, which shows what they use your data for. So here they're collecting data. They're collecting your name and your address and your date of birth. Right. Um, all of that would constitute personal data, right? Because you can be identified from that data. And so they're telling you here what the purpose is. Yes. Channel 4, not ITV, Channel 4, sorry. <laughs> Channel 4 is a not-for-profit organization and all our programs are funded with money made from advertising. Your address could help us deliver ads that you find more relevant. But they're going to push ads that you, um, that they believe are more relevant to you. So that's a good explanation of purpose right there. Okay. So if they provide that purpose, then it's a different 
situation. All right. So this is a privacy policy used by a company, Mauritius, that um, is very, very clear. And this is another thing that we look at in the course, mm -hmm. which is um, how to draft. One of the first things we do is we draft policies, privacy policies. So it's very, it's like a layman's type, you know, who are we, what are we doing? How do we process your data? How are you protected by law? What is personal data? How do you withdraw your consent, et cetera? So, and also the fact that you have a right to complain with, in Jamaica, it's the information commissioner. So this is a great example of a privacy policy or data protection policy. So without further ado, if there are any questions, please let me know. All right. So we have a hand raised. Okay. So we have a hand raised. I am seeing here. Let me just let this be bigger. I'm looking. I have a hand raised. Uh, hold on. I see Russell Cooper has a hand raised. Um, can we have Russell Cooper on the screen? On the screen. Um, okay, sure. Yes. Um, hi. Hello, Russell. Hi, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question in relation to the. Uh, uh, the data collection, um, what Justine was bringing up a while ago, um, reminded him just the data, the mechanism where we collect data from individuals, right? And I'm asking, does it, in, in cases of companies that collect data from um, like directors and employees and people like that, um, would it also work the same way on paper? For example, a form that collects data would it work to have um, each question pointed out, you know, um, I, yes, I consent to my data being collected by uh, um, email, yes, I, I consent to my data being collected by uh, paper, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Would that work the same way? Oh, yeah, it, it really depends on what you intend to, to use the data for, because you may just, um, you may have a situation if you have employees and directors, you may want to probably, rather than, getting consent every single time you may just want to say look in their employment contracts have a clause that addresses that the fact that you may need from time to time um their personal data employee once you're employed you're going to need to provide your trn you're need, going to need to provide your nis and all of that is required by law so you wouldn't necessarily rely on the consent as a base for lawfully processing. You may rely on the processing is necessary um, for those compliance with law. So all of those things an employer will need in order to pay the employee's taxes or pay PAYE as well as the employer's contribution. So all of those things would be necessary and required. Um, so there may be another basis on which they can collect that information and you can put in their employment contract that they, you will process their data in accordance with the Data Protection Act. Since it's an act okay, all right, thanks. I have another question um, okay. and it has to do with um, the time. Does the act um, speak to a time limit uh, after which um, data controllers are required to hold data for? So let's say you collect data for customers if you are a supermarket chain or you know you collect data for customers. Is there a requirement or a time limit stated in the act of how long you should hold that data for? Okay, that's a great question actually. I think we had addressed it earlier on. Um, the, the act does not say um, you need to hold data for a specific time. The act says that you cannot hold it for longer than is necessary. But what is contemplated is that each sector will come together and say, look, this, this, is, this is the normal time. So banks, for example, they may want to hold it for a certain period of time. And then JBA, the Jamaica Banking Association, may come together and say, look, 
we're going to hold it for seven years or however long because they also have anti-money laundering obligations. You as a supermarket may just say, look, we don't need to hold information for longer than two years. It really depends on the sector. Um, attorneys, okay. you may hold it for a long period of time. Um, and then, you know, so it really depends on what industry they're working with. And I think that the act does a really good job of accommodating that. Okay, thanks, Justin. Okay. You're welcome. All right, the next question is from 18 degrees north. I am Zara Burton. My company is Global Reporters for the Caribbean, and my show is 18 Degrees North Investigations. Um, I wanted to ask a question regarding, <clears throat> it's like several questions. The first one is, if you have a mailing list from way back, and uh, let us say this law goes into effect two years from now, mm -hmm. and all of these different rights and the ramifications of the law weren't expected excuse me, weren't explained to that previous set of persons. Are you going to have to start over your mailing list from scratch? Because I saw where when it went into effect in the UK, a particular agency contacted me and said that they're basically asking you now to opt in if you want to continue receiving emails and that kind of thing. So what about pre-existing mailing lists? Do you have to start from scratch? That's question one. Okay, so the opt-in, I think that's two different things, really, because the opt-in and the, the request from the UK company would be to now regularize their operations so that they can get your consent, given that the GDPR and the UK Data Protection Act 2018, which um, enacts the GDPR into their national law, they would now have that enhanced standard for consent that we now see in our act. So I think what they would have been doing was sort of a belt and brace kind of thing to accommodate that. Do you have to start from scratch? I don't think so, but you do need to ensure that the data that you're collecting thereafter, once the act is in operation, is um, in conformance with the, the law. Okay, so in other words, you can add on. Pardon can me? I, so you can add on, but even just, just making sure the add-ons are the ones that are in compliance. Um, yeah, I guess the, the thing is that the, the ones before, they still, their, their rights really start whenever the act is, comes into law. So they can come to you and say, look, we would like to be removed from this mailing list because they have rights, they have rights to, for you to get consent to direct marketing. So they can do that and they're, they're, it's their right to do that. And what you could decide that you want to send it out to everybody and say, look, do you want this? Just to ensure that you don't have any PR issues or um, issues with people getting upset that they're still getting these things you could elect to do that. But technically, when it was collected, it wasn't unlawfully collected. But you okay. continue to do it thereafter would then probably raise issues for people. So you could do that as a belt and brace, because people, as I said, could come to you and rightly so and say, look, we don't want you to send us these things anymore. Please stop. OK. Um, the other thing is, in terms of if you're an employer and you want to get qualifications of potential applicants to your business, when you are calling a university to check on credentials or any other institution to check on credentials, what is your right as an employer now to be able to do that? And what is the university's or the institution's obligation to reveal information that this person, yes, worked here from such and such to such and such? And that's a very good question. I think that the university rightly so should get their, the consent of the data subject to release that information um, before doing that. But I do believe that there's an exemption in the bill for educational purposes 
but I can't recall right now the en entire scope of it. Um, well, but, this is for climate purposes. No, I'm talking about the, yeah, but the information that you're collecting is educational, no? Well, it's just to find out if the person resume really is correct. You know what I mean? Like if you want to check that this person worked at this institution or this company or, you know, that they have a degree. Right. So I believe there's some exemptions with regards to education, but I can't, I can't recall the extent of it right now. But at the same time, um, at the same time, I think that there should be some consent that is procured from the data subject. But Denise, I think that I think that it's probably time to um, move over to Omar. I know he has a lot to tell us about, and yes. so I thank you once again for having me. All right. So I'm going to say, Darlene Allison iPhone, Helene Christian, they have questions. Is it possible for them to put those questions in the chat so that whether by email or another means, um, the Stock Exchange team can get their questions answered? And we want to thank you for participating because I think, you know, this has been a very exciting session. And for those of you who, you know, want compliance as a career, this is it. This Stock Exchange eCampus certification is your ticket. Now, I want to introduce Omar Bell. He is the Technical Services Manager of T-Tech Limited. How are you, Omar? Um, Omar Bell is an engineer with a passion for IT who helps organizations get the most out of their IT investment. And following on the awesome presentation by Justine Collins, who laid out the legal framework and is integral in the teaching of the Stock Exchange's eCampus certification, I think Omar is going to add the IT side of this data protection presentation. That's really gonna gel it together for the, now we're at 200. 15 participants. Now, Omar's educational background includes a BSc, BSc in electrical and computer engineering from the University of West Indies, of West Indies Trinidad campus, as well as training in multiple areas such as certified information systems, auditing, Microsoft Azure, Microsoft System Center, Active Directory, and PowerShell, just the name of few. So again, I welcome you, Omar. Uh, thank you so much, Denise. Uh, great presentation, Justine. Uh, really love those examples of their consent. Um, very, very useful. Uh, let me see if I can get this presentation up. Okay. Um, hope everybody's seen a presentation now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks okay. again. You can see? Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, so know that Justine has given us a, a very good example or a, a good understanding of that, the data protection bill and its requirements. I'd like to discuss how we'd start to prepare for it. You know, um, not I won't go into too much technical detail and we'll keep it at a very high level. Um, but what we need to do from an IT perspective. Now from an administrative perspective, you're, you're going to need to start the process of appointing a, a data protection officer. Um, and a few of us have been debating whether that person should be internal or external given the requirements to report independently. Um, but I get, that's something that we can discuss uh, later on. Uh, so this is what we need to do from an IT perspective. So once the bill passed, it's passed to law, um, your next step should be achieving compliance, uh, maintaining compliance and, and managing the risk. Right? So with respect to achieving compliance, it is important to know that organizations need to not only do but be able to prove 
that they've done everything that could be reasonably expected to protect data. All right? So this is going to include some documentation of processes, uh, a couple of new policies to ensure that everybody in the organization is on the same page about what, what needs to be done and what you need to achieve. And then you're going to need to implement some controls to ensure that you know, everybody is doing what they need to do um, and nobody's falling outside uh, of, of, of the requirements. So as Justine discussed before, uh, there are eight legal obligations or eight data protection standards uh, covered under the new, the new bill. I won't get into all of them because from an IT perspective, uh, we're really concerned with three. Uh, the first one, uh, how the personal data is obtained. And Justine gave a great example about the consent mechanism. Um, the standard says data, personal data must be procured lawfully and consent must be, um, must be freely given. So from an IT perspective and an efficiency perspective, uh, a lot of organizations are going to want to use technical means to gain that consent, you know, opt-in emails, websites. You're going to need to know, one, um, if you're going to keep that consent information electronically, you're going to need to protect it as well, you know, um, and you're going to need to be able to pull that information to prove that you got consent in case you need it. We're also concerned with the seventh standard, how the data must be protected. And this is where re the, the real meat of the IT um, will be. You know, the per personal data must be protected using the appropriate technical and organized, organizational methods to ensure that it's not accessed in an authorized or unlawful um, method. And there's no accidental loss or, of, or destruction of that data. The third one is the eighth standard, uh, where data can be stored or transferred to. You know, this one is going to be important for, for organizations that are using or plan to use cloud services. You, know, um, you may have some sort of application like Office 365, or maybe your accounting software is in the cloud and not installed on servers at your office. So, you're going to need to have a conversation with those vendors and determine whether their practices meet these new data protection standards. Uh, as a rule of thumb, um, if they are GDPR compliant, uh, some of the work is already done because there are some overlaps with the GDPR laws and our new data protection law. So, uh, they may not, or they more than likely will not be, you know, um, know or, or be aware of what our new data protection law um, requires. Uh, but you can start the conversation about their GDPR compliance and that, that, that will get you part of the way. You need to have a good understanding of the three W's I call it, the what, where, and who, so that you can start to plan how your access management looks like, you know? So the what is, what personal data do I have for not only customers, but employees as well. Um, you do have employee personal data that you need to protect. And there's also a distinction between personal data and sensitive personal data that was already discussed, which includes health information. And you need to also ensure that your sensitive company data, you, you, you are aware of where you have it, you know, and what public company data you have. You need to know where this data is or where this information is. Um, not all organizations are fully electronic, so there may be some files in filing cabinets. It's important you know what is in the filing cabinets, who has access to it. You know, it, it is, is the key for the filing cabinet in a coffee cup on somebody's desk um, that anybody can get access to in the middle of the night. It's important that you, you, you understand these things. Is your data in on-premise servers, you know, your servers in your building? Are they in local data centers, as in are they hosted 
in in on servers that are in Jamaica? Are they in remote data centers, you know, the cloud as well? Or do you have a lot of the personal data being passed via email? And finally, you need to understand who has access to that. Uh, is it a department, you know, a particular team, particular role, or just one in individual? All right. Now, once that initial process is completed, you'll have a, a better idea of, you know, how much data you have, you know, who has access to it, and how that data is passed within the organization, you know, how it flows from department to department, from workflow to workflow. You should have a good understanding of who has access, you know, who currently has access to that data, you know, um, is it particular roles? Um, what we have seen, or what you may very well realize, is that there are some roles, individuals, or departments that have access to personal data when they really don't need it to complete their workflows. Um, they have it because it, you know, it's just how it's always been. That's how it was set up, uh, and nobody has made any attempt to change it. So once you have all of this information, um, you, you can start the process of putting together the policies, you know, and the, the, the access framework that's going to, going to be needed um, to, to form your data protection plan, right? Um, and, and a lot of this is going to be around controls to ensure that people only have access to the data they need uh, to do their workflows and nothing more. So how, how do you go about protecting your data and getting to this compliance? You know, at, at, at a high level, it, it's going to require um, IT governance, you know, that's, that's the, the broad term. And that really is just a bunch of policies and documentation uh, that, that you, you need to ensure that everyone in the organization understands and, and is compliant with, right? Because remember, we, you, you may need to prove that you've done everything within reason to protect this data. So it's very vital that you have this documentation in place. I've found um, in general that IT policies don't get the same level of, atten of attention that other organizational policies get. You know, um, it, it, it has really kind of been pushed back before, um, but with this data protection bill soon to be law, it's going to be vital to get the same degree of attention and focus that policies within your organization get. Right? From a, a technical perspective, um, data security is going to be Uh, Andre, um, we have an interruption. Uh, so it seems, I believe, um, probably the in Mr. Bell is having some internet issues. Uh, it's not like he's back, no? Okay, right, he's back. Hi, Omar. We, we seem to have lost you for a minute. Yes. So we're just going to pick up back. Yes, this is the exact slide. So let's pick up back here from the top. Okay, great. All right, great. All right. So yes, I was saying, how, how do you go about protecting that data? Um, data security is going to be very important for you to address uh, within the organization. Um, you know, just to ensure that you can prevent loss, uh, corruption, and you know, compromise of your data. 
you're going to need to do security assessments, you know, to to see if there are any vulnerabilities within your envi in your within your environment, you know, and, and address them as quickly as possible. You need to secure the physical workspace. Um, so within this office space, on a basic level, um, you, you need to ensure that the physical files are, are locked away or you need to start the process of converting them to digital files. You, know? um, you need to have an understanding of, of what staff are authorized to go into particular areas where sensitive data is, you know, filing rooms or your server room. You need to control access to these areas. Um, and you can do that with a variety of means, not just a lock and key, but your know, ID cards, uh, magnetic swipe cards. And uh, these have the advantage because you can audit it. You know, it, there, there's a lot of rich data that you can get that would be useful if there is an issue, a breach, and there needs to be some sort of investigation. Uh, you need to secure the, your network as well you know and this is ensuring that your wireless has your know, proper um security you know the, the the wireless for your organization or your corporate network is not just open um and accessible to anyone uh you need to ensure that there's encryption on your files and devices so by default all workstations within an organization especially mobile ones, you know, laptops and mobile phones need to have encryption. Need to ensure that if for whatever reason those devices are lost, the data that is being held on them cannot be easily retrieved. And this is particularly important during this um, COVID pandemic when a lot of people are working remotely and from home, there is an increased risk of, of devices getting stolen, you know, from cars, from people's homes. So this is vital um, to get done. There needs to also be the appropriate security on all of your devices, the workstations, your servers, and this includes antivirus. Um, free antivirus is nice, but you get what you pay for. Um, it's not adequate to protect you or your organization uh, with respect to things like this you cannot, it won't give you the information you need uh, to manage this, this process well. You won't know who has been compromised or if, there, if there's anything odd happening with any device on your network. The free antivirus doesn't provide any of that information to you. So it's important that you, you make the investment in, in things like that. Uh, frequent and secure backup of files, that is vital as well. Uh, Remember that the, you need to ensure that you not only protect the data from compromise, as in a hack, about corruption. You know, things happen, uh, devices fail or don't work the way they're supposed to be, but you need to be able to retrieve or restore that information as requested. And also, finally, uh, security awareness training for staff, which I'll discuss uh, a little further down. So once you've achieved compliance, you're going to need to work on maintaining it. Um, the first thing I'm going to recommend is that you raise the cybersecurity risk awareness within the organization. And why that is, uh, if you really think about it, the, the most common you know, cybersecurity attacks can be broken down into a really simple two-step process. People get exploited to get to the technology and the technology gets exploited to get to the data. You know, and it, this really happens because employees lack the, the information about what is possible and what a, an attack can look like. And unfortunately, they only really learn having experienced it first time. Um, the, the, the most effective way to address this is really to raise the overall security awareness training on the organization with training. You know, um, it's very important that you, you, you employ your employees uh, to, 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 to be able to identify, you know, things like this. Um, it, I, I personally believe it is mandatory, you know, uh, especially with this law. And at minimum, it should be done for the employees who are most at risk. Mm -hmm. 
all management staff, C-level, if there is a C-level, and in particular, anybody that handles money, any payment processor or handler, you know, anybody that is involved in the ordering process of raw materials or goods, um, you're vulnerable as well. They need to be trained. And the training should not just be a one-off thing. It shouldn't be a, a class that you go to once and you get a certificate and that's done. No. The, the, the cybersecurity threats change daily. You know, uh, and it's important that you know or you keep up to date. So I really think that the, the, at least once a year, everyone should refresh themselves on you know, what attacks are possible, um, what they look like, and what you can do to mitigate that risk. Security audits are going to be important as well. You know, what, once you put in the initial policies and, and the documentation, you're going to need to ensure that things don't drift too far from what you want. Uh, because once they start drifting, then you're going to introduce new risk you know, and, and things and the possibility for things to just go uh, very wrong. So uh, on a yearly basis, uh, there needs to be a review, you know, of what the policies are, what the security procedures are, um, is everything in compliance or everyone in compliance with these policies and procedures. Uh, you need to review the, 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 the procedures with respect to the backup and the destruction of data. And, and that is going to be something new because organizations never had to deal with a lot of destruction of data before. It's always been focused on protecting it and keeping it for as long as they need to. Uh, but they're going to have to be some process to destroy data if a, if a, a, a customer requests it. You need to patch your devices within your organization to, to manage your vulnerabilities. Now, Windows 7, I know a lot of people have Windows 7 devices. I know it's still working. I know you only use it to check email. And that is a problem. In fact, that is quite terrifying that you're just using it on the internet any at all. Uh, Windows 7 is end of life. Uh, the vendor no longer supports it. it. They no longer provide security updates for it. And it is now a, a, a liability on your network. It is probably going to be the way they get in. Uh, so those devices need to be either upgraded or replaced with newer devices running Windows 10. Uh, I know there are challenges in terms of the CapEx fight, but there are options in terms of lease to buy or, or lease to own. Uh, so I would look into the, the various options uh, for, for this. Same is said about uh, Server 2008. Um, it is end of life. There are no more updates for it. it need, you need to upgrade any servers that you have in your environment that is running this um, and you know, have the discussions with the, your application vendors on what new operating systems um, those apps can run on. In terms of maintaining things, you need to ensure that security updates are installed on all the devices in a timely manner. Uh, security updates are generally, you know, as, as these organizations or these software vendors find these vulnerabilities, uh, they release patches every month to, 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 to close those gaps, to keep you secure. So it's important that you, you, on a monthly basis, ensure that these patches that they release are, are installed on all your devices. And that goes for the networking equipment as well. You know, from time to time, there are vulnerabilities that have been found in networking equipment that can be exploited and have been exploited. So it's important that you ensure that you, know, you, you keep the software on these networking devices up to date. Invest in the right tools. Um, remember, we need to do as much as possible to secure that data. Passwords are not enough. Um, I know many people are still writing passwords on post-its and keeping in it, them in their desks or in the back of their notebooks. Um, and it, it, it does present a, a, a risk. Um, 
multi-factor authentication it should be something that you are looking towards implementing in particular for, for any resource that's accessed over the internet you know email if you have cloud applications if you have remote desktop services within your organization to get access to uh, resources in in your business um, you need to start looking at implementing multi-factor authentication to you know give yourself an, an additional layer of security you need to also ensure that there's adequate logging in your tools and, and in your equipment. Um, all, all, all devices aren't created equal. And if something happens, it's important that you have the data to do the investigation adequately, um, or at least to be able to, 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 to plug that gap or that vulnerability. And some of these devices, don't have any logging capability or they have it and companies just have not turned them on because they, there was no need to do it. So it is important that we do that because it does help with detection and it does help with the investigations if, if breaches occur. And, you know, cover the fundamentals, you know, antivirus encryption, you know, ensure you have a good firewall, invest in email security and this is important a lot of the attacks that we've seen uh, happening in the last few years have been phishing attacks as in emails that are um that are made, made to look valid but they're not and they have malicious links in there you know um trying to get you to click on something and put in your credentials so it can get captured and then that's used against you you know, remember i said exploit the person then exploit the technology to get to the data um, once you implement email security that takes a little bit of the load off your employees and your team members from having to be hyper vigilant and look at every single email as if it is a threat it, it, it eliminates some of the, the obvious ones but they still need to be vigilant in 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 taking a look at their email and using it on a daily basis. And finally, um, complete the data impact assessments. You know, this, this is the responsibility of the, the, the DPO, which is going to be a new role uh, within the organization, totally <laughs> new job. Um, this needs to be done on a yearly basis. You know, the details of how it should look are, are not as clear as yet, uh, but more will be I'll put out on that soon. Now, you're going to need to manage your risk in an ongoing basis. And one of the ways that you need to do that is ensuring that you have a plan when something goes wrong. You know, um, everybody has fire drills that they do um, within their organizations, you know, to plan for when something goes wrong. So everybody knows what to do. You need to have something like that for if a cybersecurity incident happens. So what I have here is is a general cybersecurity incident response plan. You know, if something happens, everybody needs to know who to contact, um, what the next steps are. Um, you know, how do you go about analyzing it? Who does the analysis? How do you go about containing that threat? You know, it could be something as simple as unplugging the network cable to ensure that that co computer comes off the network. Could be something more dr dramatic as in cutting off an entire floor or a, a building um, to ensure that, that that threat doesn't get uh, to it throughout the entire organization. But you need to understand you know, what, what are the steps that are going to be taken to remove this threat. Is it just antivirus only? Um, are we going to, to manually remove these, you know, this infection if possible? Um, and how do we go about recovering and as in moving the operation back from a crisis to a normal operational state? And finally, the incident closure uh, activities. Uh, do what are the lessons learned? You know, um, is are, are there any vulnerabilities that in the organization? Uh, what type of disclosure do we need? Do we need to do disclosure to the public? You know, let them know that yes, as in our customers, yes, we've had a breach. This is what was lost. 
um, uh, disclosure to the to the team, the employees, you know, uh, so that they are aware and that they can ensure that they, they continue to be vigilant. And finally, uh, you need to get cybersecurity insurance. Um, what happens if there's a breach and there is some liability? You know, where, where, where does that money come from in order to cover you know, the, the cost of that liability? Uh, you know, Justine you know, explained what the fines could look like. You know, that, that I know will have a significant effect on the cash flow of just about any organization if, if you do get the maximum penalty. So a plan needs to be put in place via insurance um, to, to address or help to address uh, that. Cybersecurity insurance is available locally. Um, so I would you know, check with your, your, your insurance providers and you know, start having a discussion about you know, what it will take to implement that um, uh, and, and how much it covers and what, uh, you know, how, how it can help address the risks within your organization. Uh, so thank you. Uh, that, that is it from me. Thank you very much, Omar. And uh, you know, that is something to really, really think about insurance or data, which means in this modern world, your data is an asset, just as valuable as a house. You know, you have insurance for your house, you have insurance for health, you have insurance for life, in your life and now insurance for data. Because in the course of learning about data protection with the Jamaica Stock Exchange's uh, certificate programs, the, the value of this asset will become clear. So, you know, we've had an absolutely awesome session from Omar and Justine. We do have a few questions and I must say, I really appreciate how the chat room has been firing, firing, firing. Um, you know, um, Principal Parks, are, are you with us? Is, is there yes, anyone wanted to jump in and say, because we're, we're moving along, you know, we're, we're, we're really good with doing good with the time. I'm sure, thank you. Um, what I've listened to have highlighted the importance of the design of the learning outcomes of our program. Yes. Uh, that program, um, in terms of a certification that persons can derive, um, is compliance and information governance. Um, based on extensive research, as we speak today, it's the only such program available at this point in time. So we want to ensure that everyone based on the desirable learning outcomes that needs to be attained in order to mitigate um, any of the downsides as it relates to the Data Protection Act, to know that this training solution is available. Um, one of the four courses highlights data protection. So we know the importance of this because the penalty 4% maximum exposure from your global operations can yeah. have negative impact on the liquidity profile of any institution. Yeah. So we, we are very thankful for Justine and Omar yeah. based on their fulsome presentation, right? And we look forward for persons who may have a desire, who may want to learn more, who may want to ensure that the impact on the firm can be negated through yes. competent training solutions. So we want them to know that the programs are available for them, designed Principal, just for them. Principal Parks, I wanted to, you know, get your comments on this brand new career path. I mean, it's clear that the stock exchange is trailblazing to offer this program. That's very clear. But I just, I don't know if we understand how doors are being opened for a new career pathway. I don't know if you can give us two minutes on that. Well, with any um, regulation that has been promulgated and 
yes, um, the powers that be have uh, approved. We are waiting that signature for yeah. it to come into law. But at the same time, we know that regulations can change a sector. It can cause a sector to die. Yeah. And at the same time, regulations can cause a embryonic phase as it relates to new job functions and expertise. Yeah. But the reality, based on the global change, first of all, through the EU GDPR, what's yeah. happening in the Caribbean, what's happening in the, the US, um, and especially California, and now here within our sphere of influence within the Caribbean, we identify that this act yeah. is about now to come and have the potential of having a negative impact on institution. We must be aware, not just what the act requires, but have a holistic structure so yeah. that in everything that we do, we can properly prepare for compliance in terms of the compliance function in the wider array that would be required. So therefore, the program as we have designed, and we at the Stock Exchange, we are conscious that any program that is developed through the eCampus should be one that will allow the bottom line of the entities listed on the Stock Exchange those who would love to be listed, those who will be listed in the near future, and yeah. the wider effect that it will have on our beloved country, Jamaica. The need right now is to ensure that we can protect data. We can be very compliant in everything that we do to minimize the negative effect on the bottom line of organization but yeah. that's from the company's perspective. But as an individual, when that, your data goes out there, yes. it puts you at risk. So it's both sides we are very concerned about in yeah. terms of the consumer, in terms of the companies. So we want everybody to be able to be protected, both the company and the consumers. And you know, Principal Park, in looking at the chat room, I, boy, I think that this webinar could have probably been eight hours <laughs> to capture because persons asked how will the MSME sector handle the demands of the bill. There are questions about medical records and if you take an exam, uh, a lab exam, a lab, a lab test, there are uh, questions about security and if, if, you know, hacking of data, we have, you know, questions, you know, about um, financial institutions and television, telephone providers mistakenly releasing your data to the public. This is a hot button topic, um, Principal Parks. I really want to congratulate the Stock Exchange for having a winner. I mean, some of the, the comments looked at video surveillance. We already looked at medical records. Data processing accuracy and duration was touched on by Justine's awesome presentation. You know, we just looked at so much. And, and we ha we're at how many? 226 participants. Um, in this webinar, which is just awesome. Now we have been, you know, questioning, questions came in, Principal Parks, about someone recording your telephone conversation. So again, you know, data. Um, and oh, here's one. Someone says, um, well, it's Garfield Goldburn. He says, hi, Justine. I presume data protection also affects churches. And I'm sure, Principal Parks, that you will welcome church uh, leadership into the Stock Exchange's programs or certification. We welcome all who are required to both be the protector of information and those who want their information to be protected. So the programs that we have in terms of the four courses within that program, yeah, they are yeah. offered online. I saw a question coming in. Um, the program based 
on the need that we have identified yeah. and uh, has been subsidized by the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Okay. When we look at some of the other programs that are available internationally, which yeah. are, and I'm not um, saying this because we are the one delivering it, we will allow the program to speak for itself. But yeah. when you compare the cost, we are less than a quarter of what you pay for one component when yeah. we are offering four distinct courses, data protection, yes. um, um, AML in terms of money laundering, we have yeah. compliance management and compliance and information governance. So yeah. therefore, we offer it individually, person can do it as a certificate, we offer it as a program that they can get the certification for that. And yeah. it has so designed that if you want to be apply to become even the data commissioner, you'll be sufficiently armed with a yeah. free of knowledge because the learning outcomes have been designed to protect companies. The learning outcomes have been designed to enable the providers of data and the consumers of data to ensure that they are protected at the highest level. Wow. Principal Parks, we have an urgent appeal from Northern Caribbean University for the JSC to speak to them. They're having an event in August. So I'm putting that to your outreach and marketing team, Principal Parks, to reach out to NCU. Um, now, here's a big question for you, Principal Parks. Althea Daly wants to know, does she have to wait until this becomes law to do the certificate program? Well, the law is almost at our doorstep because it's just one pen away mm -hmm. from being fully enacted, fully promulgated. Yeah. Um, but we did not, as we said, we did not just design the program to adhere to the requirements of the Data Protection Act. We went wider from the compliance functionary perspective. So that with, based on the learning outcomes, we like to say the LOS has been structured so that anybody who completes can return to their job, job functions yes. with a high level of immediacy. And we like to use the term, right? Desk ready to yes. ensure that they protect the broader objectives in terms of mini minimizing and mitigating the INAID risk that are attributable within the compliance arena of which data protection is just a subset of. So it is a rich program. And so far in terms of the accreditation, um, we have sought the accreditation through the CPD Certification Services of London, England, and we are currently preparing to have it certified by UCJ because we believe in this. We need a strong program like this to ensure that Jamaica, as it continues on the economic growth path to manage some of the compliance issues that I've been having, both from the national perspective and, and, and private companies. So once we are able to construct and, and get a strong certified program, and I said, once we are able, because we just await the rubber stamp, if I may use that term, of yeah. the different bodies who have been evaluating the program. And so far, the brief comments we have received is that it's a rich program that has been established at a high global standard. So we are not just trying to adhere to the local standards, That's but right. from a global perspective. Well, we have four minutes to go. And I want to say that I believe, Principal Parks, that this is good news to Geraldine Pinnock, who says she is very, very, very interested. That's three berries, Principal Parks. Yes, and we have been getting the rapid um, fire questions. 
And you know, the tea tech presentation was in and of itself so deep and so wide. I want to thank Omar because, you know, yes, Justine brought the law, but Omar also, you know, let us look because, you know, I'll be honest, Principal Parks, where I sit, I tease to come fix my computer, you know. But what you have introduced in this data protection webinar shows the breadth and depth of a properly trained IT professional and what they can bring to the table. So I know that persons who sign up for this certification, the rigor and the information, I love what you said, Principal Parks, desk ready. So we have three minutes to go, Principal Parks. I want to thank the presenters, Justine, Omar. I want to thank 216 persons who stayed with us. And Principal Parks, I hand it over to you to close it out. Thank you so much. I just want to thank personally all of the participants and the presenters and our moderator, Denise, um, for just taking time out of your busy schedule. We know that time is a premium now. We know that there are many other webinars that are available in the sphere right now. But there's one takeaway I'd love for all of you to go away with. One, data protection is an important component in any operation, whether from your private life, your public life, or from a corporate perspective. Being prudently and effectively trained is critical so that you will have a greater understanding into the mechanism and the methodologies that you can mitigate the innate risks that are attributable to your operation. Yes. Now, the program, as designed by the Jamaica Stock Exchange with its partners, are so designed because we have identified that persons have come to the compliance sphere with different backgrounds. Yes. Persons have come with an IT background. Persons have come with a legal background. Persons have come from an administrative background. But the path to ensure that they are fully knowledgeable of the wide array of data that they need to handle the program the jamaica stock exchange compliance and information governance program and you can check this yes you cannot find from our extensive research any singular program that encapsulate all of the learning outcomes that you can attain within this six month training. It's Thank not that we're trying to just plug and advertise to say, come do the program for doing it safe. But yes. we believe in this because 4% of your global operation, yes. humongous amount yes. and the liquidity risk that you'll face would be very, very enhanced. Yes. And it would have a damaging impact on yeah. your population. And so, so let me, let me, quick points. First, um, Principal Parks to Saheed Hossein, he wants to know, is this course available to international persons? This course available to anyone within the global sphere. Awesome. And, uh, you it's know. Totally online. All right. Now, you know, I love the online because our partners, T-Tech, I mean, did you notice that slide that Omar put up with the wet, like, like a spider web of connections? I want the audience to take away, because we still have 203 people with us. I want the audience to take away the significance of what T-Tech did because, you know, we may all be excited about Justine trying to save us from seven years in prison because that's serious. But without the backbone of the IT infrastructure to make sure that data is safe, your chances of going to jail has just shut up. Yes, Principal Parks? Yes. And 
you know, Marva, she says she sincerely appreciated the preparation, the content, and the presentation. Althea Daly, she has a special thank you for Omar. Yes. And Principal Parks, it is now 3.01, so we are we're on time and we don't want to be late. So. Yeah, we're on time. And just before they, they, they leave, yes. we have a, a, a quick um, poll. Yes, um, Andre, we'll yes. put it up right now. Kind yes. of, um, as quickly as you can. It's just a few yes. questions. Yes. And, you know, yes. You can close all right so ladies and gentlemen again you know tell us how you feel and answer the survey question so that the stock exchange can continue to add value i let me tell you the jamaica stock exchange is an organization coming from a back office in the bank of jamaica building in 1969 and here we are in 2020 Yes, we are a worldwide recognized exchange. And my name is Denise Williams, just in case you didn't know. I am the principal of Financially Focused. I hope you sign up to our uh, newsletter or our Facebook page. And I want to thank you for staying with us for this presentation. I hope you got value and you appreciate, as I now do, the seriousness of data protection and again, you know, at Financially Focused, we look at the assets that build wealth. And Omar from T-Tech says, your data is an insurable asset. This is serious times, people. Thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. Thank you for the questions. And thank you for the JSC for allowing me to be your moderator for this program. Again, don't forget the survey. Thank you all for being a part of it. Good day. Have a wonderful day. Keep safe. Wear your mask. It's social distancing. Have a great day. Goodbye.